I believe that is the only announcements that I have. There are save the dates in the bulletin, but a special thank you <coughs> to, goodness, Ron and Skippy and the Johnsons and Luella, and I think there were several other people who were involved in fellowship today, so it is quite a celebration in the fellowship hall. Um, it's, it's turning into a party at this point. Uh, but, but all the more merrier for us today. Okay? All right, let's begin our service this morning. One last thing. Oh, yes, that's yeah. right. Um, usually I play uh, candle lighting music, kind of background music, when, when the candles are lit. But this is not background music today, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, everybody uh, remembers Dave Evans. Go by the mic. Uh, Go by the mic. Oh, oh. Okay. there you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good God. laughs> That's just the way it is. Yeah. Just a oh. lot of separate mics for there you go. Normal, Excellent. Normal, normal, normal All right. So uh, Dave Evans provided us with music at Strawberry Social uh, and sometimes special music in church. Well, he's uh, up accompanying the Heavenly Choir now, but he left us something behind, so I'll be channeling, well, we the Christians don't channel, do they? I'll be, <laughs> I'll be imitating Dave today, but in my own style. Uh, Jan gave me a little piece of paper with a project he had been working on, and that's what's going to be um, the candle lighting music today. I'll also use it for the offertory. What he's done is combine two hymns into one, and it's kind of fun. <laughs> yes. Call to worship is Psalm 124 this morning. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say. If the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive and their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So that will be some of our theme today in the message, but we will all have our time of worship this morning, so please join me in standing for... Bless the Lord, my soul, oh my soul. 
Uh, a little my head. A legacy from Bill Gaber. Yes. 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 Absolutely. We have been praying for him, for his eye, for yeah, his life. Yeah. That's great to hear. All right, let's share some prayer requests this morning. Who are we still praying for? Although I have a long list. <laughs> okay. Prayers for Jay Pound, who fell and broke his hip and is in recovery. He's living in Oregon now. Oh. Prayers for the Roxy Gertner family. Prayers for those traveling. <coughs> okay. Prayers for my grand niece who's receiving her flight today to begin her medical career mm-hmm. and medical school. Still praying for one grandson's marriage, and now I've added another one to it. (laughs) All right. People in Western Ohio who are seeing some terrible storms, homes destroyed, and areas just devastated. Yes. We've listed several states and areas like that. Right. Right. All right. Let's let's pray. God, we do thank you. We thank you for a beautiful summer that we've been able to experience, beautiful times with our family and friends. <coughs> we thank you for the beautiful stories of overcoming hardships, overcoming surgery, overcoming sickness, overcoming the circumstances. We thank you for, for leading us through them, for being present to, <coughs> present to us in our suffering and our hardships. As we continue to pray for those who are still struggling, we pray and speak life over those that are dealing with sickness, who are dealing with physical ailments, cancer, and surgeries to come. We speak life over those that are dealing with their mental health and emotional issues as well, trauma in life. We want to speak comfort and safety and peace over them. For those that are dealing with circumstances and hardships, we ask you to give them endurance and encouragement to keep walking through them diligently, keeping their eyes focused on you. We ask you to lead us to be your hands and feet, to love on all those around us, for everyone who is in need, for everyone who will not call out in need, but who are in desperate need of someone to to be close to In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sins us against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I truly did not know what I was going to sing today. I was wrestling with it for quite some time. Um, We... I recently participated in, in the book review of Screw Tape Letters. That was great. Um, but it led me to this passage uh, from Ephesians 6.12. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, 
but with principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. Um, sing about endurance, he said. You need endurance to stand. You will face not just one, but many different battles against the enemy. Some of you will see battles others never face. I replied, faces, that's it, faces. I grow so tired of the old snake changing faces, and yet he's the same old snake. Then the Lord said, you are not alone. There are many others with you, and everyone's faith will be tested. You'll have need of endurance. This is hard. See to it that you do not grow weary and faint. My spirit will be with you to strengthen and comfort you, and I will give you apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to help train you to wear the honor, armor. Listen to them. Share the good news with people. Do this for me as I have done this for you, because I love as the Father loves. I'll return to you soon to finish the fight. We grow tired, but we're not weary. The battle lines have long been drawn. So loves all the people. We hope that Jesus won't be long. Because there's floods, there's famine, still pestilence. There's so much need with world events. To help our neighbor, that's common sense. So why would you clap your ears and just fall back asleep while the battle rages on? The sex, there's lies, there's all the spin. The carnal nature, God calls it sin. Man needs to change his heart within. But how can he change a man unless he is born again? The battle rages on. With drugs and guns they find in schools. And teach about God that's against their rules. Then Hollywood plays you Christian and you're the fool. So why are we all aboard when you know the train's off track? Time to take your children back. We grow tired but we're not weary. The battle lines have long been drawn. So loves all the people. We hope that Jesus won't be long. Because family values, morals gone. And the love of money grows so strong. The poles say one thing, but they're wrong. Governed by the thoughts of men go right. We have a higher law, said Jesus Christ. From suicide to poverty, for every sickness and disease, we 
we hold the truth that sets them free. So why would you come aboard to just abandon a ship?
thank you. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your faithfulness shown to us, for your heart for us. We thank you for an opportunity to give back to you, to show our love and care to those around us. May you use them, multiply them, in order to show love to those in need. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> morning is from Exodus chapter 1 verses 8 through chapter 2 verses 10. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look he said to his people the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out we'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave our country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress the with forced labor, and they built Python and the Nances, the store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all the harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose name was Shepra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth and deliver, on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw in the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him longer, she got the papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what ha would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the weeds, reeds and sent a female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The second reading this morning is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us is one body with many members, and these numbers do not have all the same function, so in Christ, though many, though many form one body, and each member belongs to the others, we have different gifts, according to the grace given to all of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. 
If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So this morning, to recap some of our last few Sundays, we've been traveling through really the, the fathers in the faith. We've been traveling through the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Now we're just hearing the beginning of Moses' story itself. But as we have said, each of these times, it has followed a very similar path in nature that we see over and over throughout actually the millennia itself and some of these stories look like this where God calls out someone hears a call responds but bad things do happen oftentimes many bad things and so God works in the heart of the one who is responding and then God initiates a new naming, a new identity. And then we find ourselves in that specific role of fulfilling the, the purpose that God has for each of us individually. And in the hands of the Father, that's what is possible. Unfortunately, the, the pain that we have talked about last week, the, the circumstances, circumstances that... that throw us down brutally oftentimes, we find ourselves at a loss, and yet there is still purpose on the other side in a story that is written by God. And so, this morning, I want to really focus actually on this passage in Romans 12, uh, because we don't have enough time to pull out all the amazing details uh, that's been happening uh, in in this passage, Genesis to Exodus alone. But I want to look at specifically in, in Romans 12. It says, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. It says, don't copy the behavior, the customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then it says, you will learn God's will for you. And it says... Specifically, there are keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so, taking some inspiration from Jesus, I'm going to share these four keys, and it's not like they're exhaustive, or these are the four main keys. But I want to show these four metaphors, in fact, as something for you to walk away with, to think about when it comes to the one side that we often see it, see and we're reacting to, 
which happens to be the difficult circumstances, the heartaches, the the the, the trials, the, the things that just knock knock you down and don't want you to get back up. And how it can be transformed in God's hands. So the four things that we're looking at in the world that I want to, to use as kind of uh, a comparison. So we're looking at one side versus the other. And these are the four things. First, and I actually brought some visuals. <laughs> because I want to make sure you walk away with something to think about. So first, there is chaos in the world. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of work, Wendy. Right. <laughs> okay, there's work going on in the there's there's chaos going on in the world. Okay, there's chaos when we look at at structures and organizations and uh, and natural disasters, often natural disasters these days. And so chaos can can look like this. So. This was specifically planted by my kids in hopes for a really beautiful crop. And as you can see, it was eaten by deer. <laughs> <laughs> because this one happened to be sitting over the top of the fence. This is a leaf of a giant sunflower. And we have three left. And they are anywhere between 7 and 10 feet tall. And so they have a few. And we're going to harvest the seeds and things. But there were quite a few as well that were being eaten. And as you know, once they're bitten, they pretty much stop growing. They, they, they shrivel at the top where the, where the deer eat them. And then there are the weeds, okay? I have no idea what weed this is. <laughs> but it is all over the place in the garden. <laughs> and there are plenty of weeds. And in fact, the weeds look bigger in the garden than the plants that we want. Okay, the weeds have a way of just infiltrating, and this was the first year that my kids uh, did an intentional plot. I'm trying to think it's something like eight by eight feet, so it's not big, but there are more weeds in the garden than there are the plants that they were hoping to succeed at, but it's okay, because it's, it's a process of learning. In fact, it, there's a lot more work into a garden than, than one might think, right? Yeah. Yes? In fact, you're like... It's a lot more work. <laughs> Thank God that we have the food that we want, right? Okay, so the next one is chaos in relationships. And I realize that this one kind of, this one kind of uh, crosses over in the world because the one that I pulled out was actually ashes. Okay, so we know that there's been fires in Hawaii. There seems to be fires all over the world where it's, it's drought, it's destruction, it's, it's just this sense of helplessness and this sense that things are burning and they should not be, right? There is this pain of loss that's just devastating and you don't know what to do next. The first time I led a, uh, a trip was about 20 years ago now, and this trip was to Katrina. Hurricane Katrina came through, barreled through a major area, and just devastated certain parts of states. And I was living in Florida at the time, that's where I'm from actually, and when I took this group of uh, college students, we went in, and while we were driving to the location we were going, you could see on the right and left, right down trees and down homes, and we're driving through what, what looks like a, a fully, you know, devastated area. And we get there, and our job at this point, which was only, um, it was only a few weeks after Katrina came through. And so our job was not to create anything except for, except for space. Meaning we went in, and our job was just to start cleaning. It was just to start pulling the broken pieces so that it can be cleaned up, so there can be space for what comes next. Okay, and we'll get into that. All right? But the next thing I want to do, because in relationships, in relationships, these, these 
fires, these, this ash can feel like, like wasteland within us. It feels like we go through the fire and the most things that hurt us, in fact, are from relationships. In fact, studies actually have, have said that the primary source of trauma in life is from someone who you know. So three out of four uh, people who have trauma experience it from a close relationship. Not close like you're, you, you're on good terms, but close like a family member, a name of someone who is within your vicinity. And that's where most trauma happens, is in, that, is in that relationship. And it leaves the same element that we see around us when a natural disaster comes through, but except it's within us. And what do we do about that? The next one is chaos from within. So there is the chaos from relationships, the chaos from within leaves us confused. It leaves us, leaves us vulnerable in a way that we do not like. And we do not want to feel for very long at all. And so we do everything in our power to make ourselves feel stronger, feel safer, feel a sense of well-being, even if that is self-medicated in whatever kind of, whatever kind of way we can find. And then I put lastly, there is chaos, unfortunately, in our Christian circles too. There is cynicism and there's judgment and there's pride, and it leaves us, again, feeling like we have nowhere truly to turn to. And it must be, it must be attributed to God as well. Why can't he fix these things? And yet, and yet, where's my, oh. And yet, through it all, through the chaos in the world, through chaos in relationships, Chaos within us, chaos within the church. There are other things that are happening. And I'm going to pull this one out, even though it's late in the season. Sorry. Those things are not. Oh, I, I messed up the flower. Who's a gardener? Anybody a gardener in here? You can hardly see it. But does anybody know what this flower is? It looks like arbutus. A what? Arbutus. No, well, I don't know what that name is, but, <laughs> but I, I, unless it's the scientific word for radish. Oh. This is a, a radish flower, and my kids planted a lot of radishes in the garden, and at some point, they couldn't see where all the radishes were because the, the weeds were taking over, and, and so some of them continued to grow and produce, uh, produce um, flowers. But, but they are beautiful. <laughs> uh -huh, they are. And this is the other, that just flowers in the garden, okay? What I'm getting to is, is chaos in the world. There's devastation, there is weeds, there's destruction, but out of that can grow beautiful things, amazing things that either feed us, feed our body, feed us emotionally as well. And so there's an opportunity to steward it, to steward it better and better. And so our goal in, in terms of the garden is to lay waste to the weeds even more so. And to really steward in a way that, that nurtures the plants, right? I, I mean, Luella brings plants just about every week. And, and there's amazing care and work that goes into it, right? Especially for all you gardeners. You know that it takes hard work to be able to grow the things that are needed and to be able to minimize the things that can take over that life. Now, the next one, chaos from relationships. Unfortunately, we've talked about these, we've talked about these ashes, we've talked about these burned, burned pieces of wood, but you know what happens uh, or can happen through, through burned charcoal? What is a primary use of charcoal? He, but something else. A filter. That's right. So activated carbon and burned wood is one of the cleanest forms to purify water. And and nutrient dense when it comes to uh, to a burn. In a, in a controlled way, you can actually produce very 
very healthy, nutrient-rich soil from, from ashes. And it's a sad thing because uh, when I was living overseas uh, in South Africa, they did not use any pesticides. Uh, they did controlled burns. And every year there was a season where you knew the burn season started because whole fields would be set on fire and burned. And of course, you'd have different trucks stationed at different areas. Literally, you set it on fire, you let it sweep through. They did it very efficiently, actually. It was uh, amazing to watch. But the point was, you burn it off, you let it sit, you let, it, you let the nutrients go down deep, and then you grow. You grow the crops that you want. Okay? And it's, and it's hard to see because when it's burn season, it smells terrible. <laughs> and the smoke is also terrible. So I wanted to talk about these elements before I tell you about these last two. Because these are the blessings, unfortunately, that can come through our lives. We, we talked about a blessing being that which enables us to do what we have uh, been made to do. The enabling of, of living out a purpose, living out, living out what, is, what is intended by your life. And so we have a general blessing. The blessing that comes when we are looking at uh, looking at either a garden, and we're trying to grow those, uh, we're trying to grow the the pieces inside of us that that God wants us to to live outside or live out, which is things like character, which is things like uh, like love for others, which is uh, which are those elements that that help us to to live the way God intended. And unfortunately, like we have said, it is through the hard times and how we are responding to those hard times that ends up being a, a practice field for us to live it out. The last two elements that I wanted to share was about ourselves. I realize that it's already 1030. But when it comes to... No, not this one. I wanted to share this because out of the garden, I, I, I brought this one because it's a cookbook, but it has no words on it because it doesn't need words. Who has cookbooks in their house? <laughs> Who bought a cookbook because of the picture on the front? <laughs> Who would rather look at the picture than open it up and actually make the <laughs> That's right. That's right. I see you in the back. A meal is one of the most beautiful things that we actually experience in this life. A well-done meal prepared exquisitely, and there's pictures on the back too. <laughs> a beautiful meal is, is like ourselves. We have a lot of things within us, a lot of ingredients that are sitting within us. There are strengths, there are that there are talents, there are skills, there are personality traits that when you take them and in a beautiful way, especially with a master chef, you can create a meal that, that you will remember for the rest of your life. But it has to be assembled, it has to be, has to be thought through, it has to have certain ratios some, some spices need only a little bit. Some spices need more. Some ingredients you want to, to be kind of the, the main aspect of the meal. So, so what it means is, is all those elements are there. But in whose hands makes the difference and how the meal is experienced? And then lastly, in terms of chaos in the church, but an opportunity, unfortunately... It can be like this puzzle. And I want to share it with you. Hopefully you give me a second. Because it's my favorite puzzle that I have. It was given to me as a gift. And it looks like this. It is not straight edges. Okay? It is not... Uh, it, it's not... Um, the pieces aren't all square. You know how they have like... Uh, they're usually square looking pieces. I want to show you some of these pieces. Because they're, they're really small. But... The amazing thing is, I'm gonna, they're all about this size, and if you can tell what this is, they look like that. 
Well. It's a deer. Every single piece is an animal. Wow. And every animal combines with each other to create, and I dropped one. No, don't lose them. No, I can't lose them. Unfortunately, I lost one. When I put it together, we ended up getting a dog, and my puppy ate one piece. <laughs> so when I put it together, there's a piece missing. But that's okay, because I still love them. But this, this is a, a rabbit. The reason I'm showing you this is because every single piece of the body of Christ is a different individual. An individual unto themselves, but when you put them together, creates a much bigger masterpiece. But, but to make the masterpiece, they have to fit together. Does it mean that, that when I am connected with Steve that I lose my sense of self? No. It means that I understand who he is, I understand who I am, and I understand that there's a place for both of us. But, understanding there's a place for both of us in the grand master scheme, masterpiece that is not of my design, that someone else is in charge of. And that's why it says Jesus is our head, because he knows the full picture, and he knows which pieces might fit better together. You'll see in strengths and weaknesses, you'll naturally work well with someone, maybe not as well with someone else, but we should respect and know and acknowledge that somewhere in the picture that person fits. And we need that person as well. And so, you will see chaos in the world, you'll see chaos in relationships, you'll see chaos within yourself, you'll see chaos within the church, but in God's hands... There can be beauty, there can be abundance, there can be blessing, there can be order as well, where each of us has the opportunity to live out what God has intended for us, and what God has intended for the world to experience, which is things that we now seem, that seem impossible, like unity, like love for each other, like just respecting one another, like honoring, like kindness but at the same time still being able to live fully out the gifts that each of us have. It's only in a world where we only see scarcity and limits, where we say, there's not enough room for Steve. I sing, he's not allowed up here. <laughs> and, and that's what we do. We say, there's not enough time for me and Steve. There's not enough time to grow, uh, grow a garden and do this other thing that I really want to do. You see, all of these, all these mindsets is a mindset of scarcity. It's a mindset that, that only what is in front of us is possible. But thankfully, when God is in charge of the story, when God takes us through the hardships, even if it is ash and devastation, that beautiful things can come out of this. And it's that holding on that will prove will prove the outcome, that will prove the story. We, we don't often see the, the end result. We don't often see the end of the story. And so we lose our hope, we lose our faith, because we want to see it, to believe it. But God says, keep walking with me and keep seeing, looking at me, and I will take care of the outcome. Let's pray. God, it, it seems like an impossible task sometimes to live inside this story where so many bad things happen, where so much devastation happens around us, where, where there's loss of life, loss of loved ones. But I thank you that we are only seeing a little bit, and you want to show us you want to show us really yourself. Because when you reveal yourself to us, you show us the author of the story that we can't comprehend. You show us the faithfulness and goodness and hope that we are in so desperate need of.
to know that the outcome, the ending of the story, will have a good ending. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for enabling us to, to grow our faith. Thank you, Holy Spirit, to strengthen us when we are thrown down. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us comfort and love when we need it. I pray you will open our hearts, open our minds to, to receive, receive that sight, receive that ability to hear your voice. We are in need of you. We are waiting upon you, and we thank you, God, that you're not at a distance, but you are right here in front of us, holding out your hand, waiting to, to hear our response. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's worship with our last hymn, 404.